thank you so much for joining us. Um, just to quickly introduce ourselves before we begin, I'm Lev Bredeshenko, the Curator Public at CCA, and here with me are... I'm Irene Chin, I'm Curatorial Coordinator. And I'm Francesco Garuti, Curator of Contemporary Architecture at the CCA. So thanks for joining us for this short series of conversation, actually titled, What Do We Do If They Want To Be Happy? A series of dialogues with architects and, uh, and thinkers to expand some of the topics uh, we encountered during the research of our recent exhibition, Our Happy Life, Architecture and Wellbeing in the Age of the Emotional Capitalism. So the exhibition was actually produced really as a tool um, to generate questions. It is constructed as a theater piece in, in, in four acts uh, where we explore actually in a very narrative way, law, data, people's stories and politics. Uh, or can be also described as a sort of a laboratory of life because we dissected in a, how in a direct or indirect way the so-called happiness agenda and its ideology is affecting the built environment. So various questions like how do we design our city in an age when feelings and uh, emotions are constantly tracked and are becoming the base of a new material modes of production and also, I mean, questions about the role of the profession in itself in a moment in which when we try to analyze a study, a place, or a building, or a city, or an architecture, we use sort of a, to evaluate them, you know, less and less architectural typologies and uh, physical, you know, determination and more like uh, moods, uh, uh, data rankings, and these kind of things. If during the research we collect a raw material reflection and produce questions, now we try to kind of... Uh, engage practitioners and discuss with us some of the points, you know, or maybe, you know, the interpretation and the misinterpretation that we kind of put together. And of course, it's a real pleasure to start the sequence with you. I mean, because your research has been, as I mentioned, you a constant reference for us. I mean, during the production of the show, um, and, and, but, and, and, and uh, we have been constantly studying, I mean, your analytical uh, look at the world, but of course also your writings and, and uh, the, your recent book, Four Walls and the Roof, is on our table is a sort of a diagonal reference to understand really the role of the architect today. So our first question is about 2008. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, we define 2008 as the beginning of our research in the sense that we basically have been, we've been tracking the number of the uh, happiness reports and protocols appearing on the political scene after the 2008. It is a number that grows after that moment. So the notion of the crisis and the notion of somehow the political definition of happiness are two complementary entities. But it's also for us the beginning of the expansion of the behavioral studies. So this sort of a small revolution of how we kind of a track and define what uh, CD, uh, people, people in the CD uh, uh, are, are kind of uh, living. It's also the year when Facebook actually is translated in many, many languages, the 2008. is the beginning, you know, of the worldwide distribution of the first smartphones. So, smartphone. so this idea of a tracking behavior starts to really become something. But what is for you the 2008, as a year at zero, let's say, of something? Um. Let me get to that. Uh, thanks for uh, asking me to talk about this uh, subject. Uh, I am uh, deeply intrigued by the subject uh, of happiness, uh, even if I'm not entirely convinced it is important. Uh, I think happiness is generally the human condition, uh, which is not a very good condition for uh, creativity. Uh, it's, it's generally a, a condition, a, a state of mind, which I associate with uh, um, the production of mediocrity, uh, mostly. Uh, but what I think is interesting, that it has become uh, a subject that entered the discourse so aggressively. Uh, and, and you've picked that up in the introduction of the, of, of the, of the, of the book in your essay very, very well. Um, I have a theory. Uh, and that's partly the theory which also underlies my book, is that as soon as subject, as soon as things become the subject of discourse, that is the indication that they have become a problem. That is the way I write about the community, that is the way I write about public space, that is the way I write about participation. These things become the subject of debate, become the subject of discourse, precisely at the moment that we no longer know how to deal with them and that a certain degree of 
self-evidence yeah. disappears from them. So a subject becomes a subject uh, of discourse when it's being problematized. And I think happiness uh, fits very, very well in that, um, in that sequence. So I think the fact that 2008, which was the moment of the global financial crisis, which was marked by debt, which was marked by a shortage of money for many, many people, that that actually is the moment when happiness uh, uh, indexes escalate, is, is deeply, deeply worrying. Uh, because then, I would say that is probably the indication, not of a conclusion that money is not important, yeah. but of a conclusion that money is a subject best avoided. So happiness for me is the great distractor. The whole debate about happiness is the great distractor. Uh, from a uh, distractor from rather inconvenient subjects, namely, uh, namely material wealth and particularly the very unequal distribution of material wealth uh, in the world. Once you say to people, oh, but money doesn't matter, that is very easy, uh, that's a very easy statement by the 1% who owns all the wealth to the remaining number of people who don't own the wealth. Uh, so for me, it's, uh, I, I find it a very troubling uh, subject from that point of view. That I, have to, that I have a lingering feeling that it's a form of camouflage, like many subjects are a form of, uh, of camouflage, and a very, very worrying uh, form of camouflage. I think the system has continued pretty much business as usual, and the only thing that happened is that it got ever more skillful in, in, in creating smoke screens. Uh, around its true uh, workings, and I, 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 I find uh, the happiness one particularly disturbing, because it directly infiltrates a very, very private domain. Uh, it infects the emotional domain, and it turns the emotional domain into an agent of capital, uh, to the point that it that it is worrying. You know the the, and there's a very interesting parallel with. Uh, Architecture, and you write about it in your uh, in in your uh, essay also, and I thought that was very uh, good. In architecture, you have lead, which is a, a, a series of uh, however many criteria uh, to which a building has to respond so that it's a sustainable, i.e., a good uh, building. Uh, and now, uh, now there is a way to measure happiness, which you called well, trademark. Uh, but of course, you know, once, whether something is good or bad, once that becomes a matter of ticking boxes on a list, that is the first moment of a surrender of the person in question. Uh, I am in charge of my own happiness until there is a list of prescribed criteria which declare whether I'm happy or not. So that is the first moment I surrender the verdict on my happiness, on my buildings, on my creations, to outside criteria. And, and, and that is, uh, you know, Foucault writes about uh, Christianity invading the most private domain of mankind through the notion of sin. Uh, this is, in a way, the scientific, supposedly scientific equivalent uh, uh, of it, and and I, I, I don't know. I find it a weird source um, of 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 a kind of escalating oppression that I see going on also in the Western uh, world. I mean, the world seems united at the moment in two forms uh, of oppression: either in the form of aging uh, aging male autocrats or very subtle systems like uh, performance indicators, lists, uh, et, et cetera, uh, without a leader necessarily in place, but nevertheless uh, lists and methods which dictate people how to behave, what to do, what to think, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this I find very, very uh, uh, uneasy. So you, you use the word camouflage now, and this is something we we kind of uh, I mean encounter in, in, in your discourse. There's there's uh, there's a moment where you are uh, kind of describing 
some other relation. With you, you, in, in four walls and, and, and the roof, you're talking about the Pimlico School in London, and there is that passage that you're describing the relation between the welfare state and the brutalism. I mean, and the image of you know brutal architecture connected to the benign idea of uh, the welfare. Uh, starting from the assumption of what we are discussing now, that I, basically happiness is sort of a pervasive entity affecting the surface of things or trying you know, to design our houses checking boxes or you know, through these indicators. But what that, can, can we talk about camouflage of you know, the, the new the, the, the neoliberal economy? What is, what is the image that is kind of produced into the, our architecture? Is the discourse that is valid, do you think, today still? This architecture is a sort of a perennial camouflage? No, uh, well, in, in the book it was, I mean, in the book it's, an, uh, it's presented as an unresolved uh, enigma. Where I say, uh, you know, um, how is it that an essentially benign, caring uh, uh, ideology such as the welfare state chooses to represent itself through pretty aggressive, uh, ag uh, aggressive or even brutalist uh, buildings? That seems a contradiction uh, in terms. But if you mirror the same contrast, then uh, you, of course, arrive at a rather more malicious trend, which manifests itself through a very, very sweet uh, face. You know, I think uh, the market economy manifests itself uh, by and large through leisure, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a condition, uh, as, as almost an ideal state for everyone to strive towards. And, and uh, leisure is, of course, uh, uh, enjoyment merged with consumption. You know, it, I think oppression these days comes in the form of endless entertainment. Uh, contemporary dictatorships manifest themselves through game shows, uh, through, uh, through games, through, through, through kind of uh, entertainment programs uh, with a slightly indoctrinative uh, goal, etc., etc. So I do think that the inverse parallel uh, that is signaled in my book is playing out. And, and of course, happiness is the perfect benign veneer of, of what I suspect is a rather uh, more disturbing trend. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We, we found, for example, two interesting architectural examples to trying to tackle... Uh, I mean, somehow it's a kind of a parallel discourse. So following the idea of well, uh, trademark as a sort of a kind of a new standard for designing happiness apartments, happiness houses, happiness into uh, the uh, built environment. Uh, for example, the uh, John Portman. Yeah, hotel, but the whole. I mean, uh, the whole the whole thing that happiness can be designed uh, is, is is of course a massively naive folly. Because the mo the moment happiness is designed, it's no longer a happiness. You know, you have a uh, in 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 England at the moment they have launched a, a building uh, better building more beautiful committee, uh, which okay. is essentially a committee designed to take away the power from architects, who are evil, uh, uh, selfish bastards, uh, ruining the built environment, which perhaps admittedly they are. Uh, but, but what they try to do is, in a way, uh, uh, create standards which have to do with health and which have to do with mental and physical health. And they try to establish a correlation between the type of public space and the mental health and the physical health of people uh, in it. And that is, of course, you know, and they even quote terminal diseases. Uh, uh, they bring them into the debate. Now, try and argue with that as an architect. You know, try and bring an argument about proportion, light, or, or whatever the classical things you bring to the table, and, and you have to weigh proportion uh, and size uh, to life and death. I mean, there's no way you can win that argument. Uh, and you are, by definition, uh, on the bad side. Uh, to those who are supposedly on the good side, but I, I simply don't believe it. I, I think it's a form of, of an ongoing disempowerment of architects, of the creative, of free thinking, uh, in favor of a kind of uh, increasingly oppressing moralism 
which is embedded in all of these uh, in, in, in all of these things. And you know the fact that Roger Scruton was on that committee, then he no longer was, but it looks like he is now uh, being reinstated. Of course, speaks oh. volumes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, but exactly. So I, I was mentioning, for example, Foraz was kind of a striking the example of how, uh, you know, the Stay Well program kind of refurbished the entire interior, the interior of the rooms of the Portman Atlanta, for example. But also the TD Bank, I mean, in Toronto, by, I mean, the Miss Van der Rohe has been kind of this sort of idea of redesigning a layer instead of, re I mean, it's really distant from the conceptual approach to conceiving a space. It's just a kind of a re, kind of a, layering and interior in this case is a kind of a two striking examples you know of this massive concrete architecture meant to be a sort of an interiorized space on portman side and then the modern knees be becoming a sort of a you know uh the naked structure recladded with happiness as a surf yeah but i think i mean i think happiness i mean architecture is not meant to make people happy Architecture is designed, like, uh, like any art form, architecture is designed to move people. And moving people is by definition antithetical to the kind of stable, mediocre state of happiness. If you move somebody, there are ups and there are downs. There are exceptions, there are rules. Uh, there are conventions, there are the break of conventions. It is by definition moving, uh, you know, the emotional moving of people uh, you know, if there's comedy, there's tragedy. If that's that, that, that is that. I mean, it's about the essential reciprocity between extremes, and and that is fundamentally, fundamentally different uh, from the pursuit of happiness. Mm. But that, that's exactly the point. I mean, if I mean, the, the, how do we react as architect to a market that is basically proposing this type of a? superficial treatments as a uh, the I mean yeah I have I have no idea uh, mm -hmm. so far uh, so far we are lucky enough uh, that we have enough uh, work which means that uh, there are uh, some people susceptible to the arguments and the architecture we bring to the table but I uh, I, I worry about our profession in general if this trend persists because I think our profession, call it an old-fashioned uh, profession, call it a profession with a memory, call it a profession hopefully robust enough to ride out the storm of, of all kinds of superficial arguments that are being brought to the table and hopefully emerge victorious uh, somewhere down the line. But so far so far, I unfortunately think that, that all this nonsense is a storm we have to ride out. And uh, let's say, uh, talking about storms, I don't know if it's, it's a new era or whatever that is uh, talking about storm is a smart city. So the idea of uh, the data kind of shaping urbanism. Yeah, but I, I, th I, I think that's also, that's, that is also based on a complete misconception. I also uh -huh. think that knowledge and happiness are two fundamentally different things. I, I don't think you will ever get happier from knowing more. Uh, I mean, I think, in fact, quite the opposite, uh, probably. So th I think it's all happening, and it's all kind of uh, happening at an unstoppable pace. But I think that the fundamental preconceptions that underlie it are wrong. The data might give you comfort, but they can never uh, give you freedom and, and, and the weird thing with all of this is is an ever larger sacrifice of true freedom in the name of freedom and that is what I find such an alarming paradox yeah no it's, it's, it's of course it's alarming it's a kind of a for us is also connected with the uh, I mean the discourse on the rankings uh, there yeah. is an, that is another kind of a chapter of your book that is another kind of a scary or very concerning uh, influential uh, tool that at the media level, I mean, the mediatic level is strongly used today. I mean, we were kind of impressed of reading uh, Dean Simpson book on, on the, the kind of a recent history of Copenhagen and how the role of, you know, uh, Monaco uh, 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 was, I mean, strongly connected in this idea of kind of a presenting the image of the new city together with the political yeah. sphere of the city itself. So, uh, but again, maybe, maybe I'm just posing you always the same question that I think it's about 
after basically the sort of analytical and very worrying and concerning and alarming, as you mentioned, research that we've been kind of carrying, is how do we react? How do we basically? How, I mean, the, you, you mentioned that the role of the architect is kind of a, I mean, uh, not vanishing, but kind of a taking uh, 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 different positions in, 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 the, in the actual scenario, uh, being less relevant than before. So, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I think we always have the feeling that we have to react. Uh, I mean, Trump sends a tweet, the world reacts. And he reacts to that, reacts to that. I mean, even reacting in accordance or reacting negatively, uh, negatively, also reacting is a choice. You have a choice. You also have the choice not to react. I mean, architecture could be as relevant or as is irrelevant uh, as it was before. It will exist by definition, uh, you know, and it's an old, a very old discipline. Uh, it's a much older discipline than, 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 than certain others, and it also might outlive these disciplines. But I think um, when you react too quickly, uh, hoping to continuously prove your relevance, that can also be a sign that you yourself are not overly convinced uh, of your relevance. I think architects make the mistake of taking the bait too soon. Uh, I mean, my, my book is, is by and large livable cities, placemaking, the community participation, uh, uh, even sustainability. My book addresses uh, a lot of current trends with a huge amount of skepticism. Partly because I think that the ethos of these trends is already embedded in a far deeper conscience of architecture than any checklist of Lead or Bream could ever represent. That it is already part of an, of an almost instinctive ethos uh, in architecture that is implicitly present and that, that making these things so explicit, which is the trend at the moment, leads to a kind of very, very trivial simplification of these complex issues. And therefore, once you react to it, uh, you, you fall victim to that yourself, and you also become an impoverished uh, version of yourself. I think the trends, and then architects' instinct to react, 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 also turns, has helped turn architects into caricatures. <coughs> You know, and, and they at one point they might have had an overblown sense uh, of their importance, then they have an, an inferiority complex, then they go back to an overblown sense, etc., etc. But they, they are very easily provoked uh, as a profession, because partly because they're self-obsessed. So anything external is an affront by definition, um, and partly because they don't look enough around them and then around them also beyond the trends that that are affecting them to to the reasons of these trends so that you can also take these uh, uh, trends with a grain of salt that's I think what architecture should do take the happiness placemaking uh, public space uh, uh, livability with a huge huge grain of salt um, and then of course if you have questions you can sure well, well part of the authority that the politicians and economists claim since we're talking about reacting is that they claim they have these predictive powers so a large part of our project was about the polling and asking through surveys how people are feeling and that is their data and that's their predictive power so we were uh, wondering about your project foresight and hindsight and yeah. what we, uh, the architects don't have predictive tools. No, 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 but foresight and hindsight was, I mean, I don't think a poll will ever give you any sense of the future. I think opinion polls are largely echo uh, caves. Yeah. Uh, but the foresight and hindsight uh, project we did wasn't necessarily an attempt to predict the future in as much as it was an analysis of predictions from the past often predictions from the past about the past or predictions about the past uh, about the present, at which point uh, these old predictions b uh, got a kind of charming uh, degree of, uh, of ev uh, a charming possibility to evaluate them. And again, take them with a grain of salt and use them um, 
as a compelling reason to take some of today's prediction with a grain of salt. Because, I mean, um, there was a very um, interesting analogy in that project, and that was that the predictions are the domain of the scientist, they're the domain of advertising, they're also the domain of the old fortune teller. And they all have one thing in common, most of the time they get it wrong. But how wrong do they get it? And, and there, in that project, there was an interesting pattern that we saw uh, where you would assume that a scientist is in a good position to make accurate predictions about science, uh, that uh, artists are in a good position to make predictions about culture. Nothing uh, is further from the truth. Uh, we found that artists were experts on the economy, uh, prophets uh, were experts uh, uh, on, 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 on science, etc., etc. I mean, more often people were right about things that had nothing to do with their own domain than they were right about their own domain. So uh, it, it was in a way an analysis uh, that served to a kind of encourage a kind of uh, cross-disciplinary, cross-border looking uh, attitude, uh, but it also served in a way to uh, prove the relative value of predictions and, and, and future trendings uh, as a whole. That was the point of, the, of that project. Yeah, and, and no, we, we looked at it because uh, um, actually the, the companies collecting data about well-being, uh, I mean, when they have, they have to advertise their work, they're really talking about the future. They actually, yeah. even if they are collect, I mean, they're just making polls, they are saying, I mean, we could have predicted Brexit, actually, because, you know, the economy in the UK was going great, but if we could have checked, actually, the emotional condition of people, this was, you know, the, you know, the spread between the economical data and the emotional condition, you know, they were... It was the largest spread ever had in UK or in Europe since ever. Yeah. So, this is this is a, a kind of a interesting component of our project. This sort of a tension between assuming the possibility of looking at the future and this integration to me of what we mentioned at the beginning, the emotional conditions as a sort of a, you know something that now. Yeah, but but when we talk about emotional. I mean, the the, the strange thing is that you talk yeah. about an emotional condition. And you do a prediction about it, like you're predicting the weather. The emotional condition is a human condition. So I find there is an inexplicable contradiction between the notion of happiness by design, which is propagated, and then the notion of predictions, which talks about happiness like it is the weather. Uh, and therefore, nothing is further from design than the weather. So I spoke earlier about a distraction from the fundamental issues, which in my view have to do with material wealth. And architecture is a very material subject, which uh, in a way has, has to do, have to do with a fair distribution of material wealth. The more you distract from them, the more people uh, are apparently persuaded uh, to vote against their own interests, which, uh, and I think the worst consequences are yet to come. Uh, uh, of that, of, of a kind of a, of, of a political system which has gone completely haywire. And there's no telling what will happen. There's no telling who is a traditional ally of, uh, of who. Uh, I, I mean, authoritarian tendencies run through uh, autocratic countries just as much as they run through uh, democratic countries. And it's like the divide. Uh, runs at very, very untraceable, hard to locate uh, places. In, in, and, and in those terms, then any political action uh, be becomes in turn an echo of the echo. Like, I don't know, I hold an opinion poll, let's ask the people, they don't know, I hear the echo of what I said, and therefore the echo turns into my policy. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and more and more the kind of political sphere, therefore, is a vessel without a rudder. You know, and I, I simply don't think that this will bring us to the promised land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't I, know if I'm making any uh, sense because I mean, it's this. A lot of this uh, is 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 off the cuff, but it 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 feeds back to, uh, I, I guess, the same observation I, I tried to make in the beginning. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's 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 very clear and very interesting. Um, so I mean, I have a question about uh, because you know the 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 story of of Marzan that you that is on the cover of your book and and uh, I mean we kind of a uh, in a way we read it. It was very interesting for us, and by chance we also I mean in the bibliography we found that. Uh, the, the the new neighborhood is defined the epi district now in, in in Berlin so it was it was a detail that just immediately caught our attention of course the story is much more complex than just arriving to happiness but can you tell us a bit of the story of Marzan because uh, of course contains a lot uh, in terms of the reflection between about our present condition we feel yeah well the Marzan is a is 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 a Hellersdorf Marzan is a big uh, uh, housing district that was constructed in the 70s in the former uh, in the former East Germany. It is the largest new town uh, ever built in the shortest possible uh, times. Uh, over 250 homes built in an incredibly short period, all with prefabricated concrete with the traditional uh, uh, prefabrication uh, factories you had with kind of coded systems in which architects only played a role as the designers of those systems, often without a say as to where their buildings would be realized, etc., etc. It is a completely mechanical form of providing housing. But the most shocking thing there was, I saw the old imagery uh, of the 1970s when it was populated by, you know, regular civilians. And it actually looked a lot like the place where I grew up, which was not behind the Iron Curtain, which was not in Eastern Europe, but which was in the Netherlands. And uh, doing more research, I found that the factories uh, who, um, for instance, made the facade panels of these prefabricated housing uh, estates were the same as the ones that had provided the facade panels to the flats where I grew up. Uh, that, in fact, certain parts of West Berlin from the 1970s look suspiciously like East Berlin, that, in fact, the neighborhood where I grew up can be found in the communist world, too. So that at that time, we had a world which was ideologically split, but the physical substance was remarkably similar. Currently, we have a world which supposedly is ideologically unified, and the asymmetries are vast. And that is, again, a, a, a kind of, in my view, a very, very underexplored uh, paradox, which also, you know, casts, uh, they call it the happy district now, uh, but the imagery I saw of it from the 1970s and, and my own uh, childhood memories of a place very, very similar uh, in the Netherlands is, is also that of a happy uh, childhood. You know, even though we never, even though happiness was not particularly a subject uh, at the time. Yeah, and, uh, but then, you know, the question is, uh, uh, so, uh, we, you know, we, we have to deal, you know, with your, 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 the notion you're making of this sort of a, how can I say, erased modernity? Or, I mean, it's, everything goes back to these, this sort of, a, you know, such a simple pitched roof typology. Well, no, I, 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 I think what they did in Marsan, in, in what they did there, there was a lot of 11-story uh, apartment blocks. They, uh, they didn't demolish them, but they demolished seven stories of them, so then they all became four-story blocks. When the 11-story the blocks became four-story blocks, uh, then apparently people were happy, uh, which is interesting. Um, and they call this, in, in German, they call this normalisierung, you know, making normal, uh, which for me was also a, a very strange uh, thing, because, I mean, these, these, these earlier blocks in themselves were the products of standards and norms. Uh, these... Uh, highly standardized apartments, which were supposedly the normal conditions for families to live in. So that, in a way, uh, normalization is the undoing of the normal, uh, or the undoing of the norm is, is also an interesting uh, paradox. I think I have a phrase in there, I can't remember exactly, when I say that uh, communism was characterized by 
uh, a radical pursuit uh, of the mundane. The market economy is characterized by a mundane pursuit of the radical. Uh, and, and, and you're sort of back to square one, uh, is what that says. So if the fans were out, it's sort of, you know, the ideal uh, kind of a modern uh, architecture, and then everything kind of uh, goes kind of deleted or uh, 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 canceled, and then we are back now to a sort of a pictured roof house uh, where maybe uh, there is maybe a smart home uh, uh, inside, and maybe, you know, the surfaces are anti-toxics, and uh, they are designed according to the standards and the well. So I'm just wondering, it's a kind of a matter of cycles of the of life or the of, of the history, sorry, of the architecture history, where there is a kind of a, uh, you know, we are in a moment of involution of, of, of the discourse, uh, or uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think what the kind of a, what the metaphor is, the story for our present today. Well, I, I, it's, it's again a tendency, I think, to react. It's, it's so very interesting. I mean, if you, if, going back to Marzahn, you know, that was a very homogenous district. Uh, it's currently being converted uh, from, uh, from the philosophy that you can't homogenize people. Everyone is different. Uh, we are a very diverse society, etc., etc., etc. I only very partially believe that. Uh, I think the dirty secret of mankind is that we all want the same, but we don't want to be told. Uh, so, uh, and as soon as we are told, uh, we probably insist on a level of diversity which is also not so close to the truth. We want to think that even if we all want the same, that that is our hyper individual personal choice and our personally uh, chosen destiny. So I think we go back and forth. Uh, you know, between uh, denying uh, and acknowledging that inevitable truth. And that is also why I think, uh, you know, that is an enduring truth, which is also, and which is also why I think architecture as a discipline may go through some very strange stylistic hoops, uh, you know, between a romantic embrace of the future back to a romantic embrace of the past. And I'm sure that dialectic will, will continue for a while, and I also don't think uh, that that is necessarily a problem. Just as long as, as, as architecture, ar architecture like people uh, surrenders the fact that it has a choice and surrenders uh, it, its own sense of right and wrong and its own sense of good and bad which admittedly varies over time, just as long as it doesn't surrender that to pre-described lists. And just as long as it, it remains immune and, and uh, to all of those things, I think the profession is going to be just fine. Um, Let you have a question? Or... Yeah, I mean, I, kind of going from what you were just saying uh, in the direction of sort of um, I don't know, subterfuge or, or ways of appropriating some of this discourse. I, something I found very interesting in discovering the research um, at, at a later date was this sort of grid of imperatives, which is not in the, in the, in the book, but is very much present in one of the rooms of the exhibition, where a sort of a survey of many of these reports from all over the world in different countries and different agencies, and, and the research team has sort of selected key kind of imperatives that uh, one place or another represents some idea of happiness. And, and what's very interesting in seeing them all together is how many actually are somehow contradictory. You know, that uh, that uh, some say, you know, limit your daily media use, you know, these kind of things. And others say, no, no, you have absolutely stay up to date with technology, for example, these kind of things. So um, it, it, it takes this idea of the happiness agenda, I think, to a slightly more interesting kind of rich uh, uh, place where there's, uh, I get a sense of there's an exploitable weakness, maybe, a kind of an ability for some people, maybe like architects, to, to pick and choose some of these uh, aspects that they want actually to engage with. And then you could accidentally arrive at a kind of a recipe for, I don't know, communism yeah. um, by engaging with this. And so I wonder, I wonder if from your earlier point. Well, it's probably a very effective survival technique. Uh, even if even if it's based on 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 the utter derision of of that which you're using, and of course, in the discourse of architect, there is a huge tradition of you know the very virtuous uh, using of arguments that architects themselves don't necessarily 
believe in. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of architects that embrace sustainability uh, probably deep down also believe different things and, and know quite well uh, that it's quite cynical uh, of what they are doing. But I think in an exhibition anyway, there's probably merit at exposing contradictions uh, between the lists because you guys are not trying to get a job from anybody. I mean, you have no uh, ulterior economic motive uh, to embrace something. And I think that that would be good. I think all of these lists, you know, the design of happiness, the measuring of happiness, it's all, it stems from a desire to control. It stems from a con desire to control uh, our destiny, uh, by others to control the destiny of others. But central is the notion of control, uh, that you make something predictable, that you control it. And I think also happiness by definition can never be the function of control. I mean, once you control your future, once your future is truly predictable, it equals death. I mean, death is the only predictable element of all our future. I mean, one is really about what I was, we were chatting uh, about at the beginning, so the success of the book. Yeah, but that makes, that makes me very happy. <laughs> uh, is that, uh, I mean, the sales of the book are, are, are the ultimate, uh, ultimate, ultimate happiness indicator for me. Yeah, it's number of copies. And but do you think there's a specific reason why, for example, this sort of a practice of the banking, the myth of the architect today uh, has, has been, I mean, has been successful? I mean... I've been debunking a lot of trends and, and a lot of presumed truths, which are very potent and very, very strong. But it's, of course, whenever something is very, uh, very, very much prevailing, that also provokes a huge backlash. And, and to some extent, my book is also a backlash to some of the stereotypes that prevail uh, in the architecture uh, world. I mean, I wrote most of the book, I, I mean, half of the essays in there are, are written without ever having a book uh, in mind. I mean, I wrote when I was either irritated or uh, enthusiastic about something, uh, mostly in that order. But I think it's also at a point that in, in the current world with so many constructed arguments, I think authenticity alone becomes an ideological program, even if it's, uh, you know, in professed in, in the somewhat grumpy writing that I do. But yeah, I mean, this is a, 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 a it's, it's, it's a point, you know, if I can project my point, uh, in, in, uh, it's also about, I mean, maybe kind of trying to put together also all these, these, these kind of points that we made now is also kind of interesting because uh, maybe it, it's a book that is going, you know, behind, you know, the scenes of a practice also. And it's interesting now because, you know, we are also trying to understand what, you know, the architectural practice is actually is. And so it's a kind of interesting to explore, you know, how the political components, the economical components are, you know, they've always been part of the, the practice and yeah. the profession, but sadly becoming so revealing much more than maybe before. Uh, this is also what I, what I thought. So thank you, Rainier. Thank you very much. It My was pleasure. A, a great conversation and, and, uh, uh, it has been great coming to go through all uh, the issues together. So thanks again. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks.